Hello and welcome back to another video on the Demystifying Medicine channel. Today's video will be a short interview with our one and only special guest, Dr. Dworkin Geva, who will help answer some of the common questions we all may have about the field of bioinformatics. Dr. Dworkin Geva completed her PhD studies in computational biology at Tel Aviv University and focused on bioinformatics of cancer during her postdoctoral studies at McMaster University. Before proceeding to the interview, please take some time to review this infographic to familiarize yourself with the basics of bioinformatics. This way, you can maximize the knowledge you gain throughout the interview. To begin, we wanted to learn more about the significance of studying RNA. So Dr. Dworkin Geva, could you tell us a bit why we should study RNA? What can it tell us about uh, disease states? Uh, so I will talk about the uh, mRNA. Uh, uh, cells react to the environment and they show us their biological state by expressing certain sets of genes. And to examine these sets of genes, we want to study the mRNA, which would reflect that. So if a cell is sick, or if it's in a sick or diseased environment, then we'll be able to see that based on the reactions of that cell and that'll be expressed through the mRNA. Right, thank you so much for that great answer. Um, now we wanted to see what is the clinical significance of tracking differential gene expression in the study of disease progression via RNA-seq? Uh, so the uh, RNA-seq uh, allows us to examine a lot of cells together because if we examine only one cell, that's just a case study and we want to see the big patterns mm -hmm. because usually that will be not just one cell, that will be a tissue or a group of cells. So. Uh, when we're comparing the normal tissue or the normal sample to the uh, sample of the uh, disease cells, then we'll be able to know what's the characteristic of the cells that are in that state. And that's very important for us because once we can see their state, then we'll be able to learn how to treat them or at least to how to recognize these cells. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you so much for that insightful answer. We were wondering if you could um, if you were able to kind of quickly go over some bioinformatic tools or and their importance in developing techniques for improved diagnosis, monitoring, or treatment of diseases, if possible? So there are many different tools, and I will not uh, mention all of them. Uh, if you want to talk about the uh, bulk or any sick, mm -hmm. so that talks about uh, samples that have all these cells pulled and we see the general patterns of expression. So for example, one of the uh, tools that uh, has been used quite heavily would be the connectivity mapping. So the connectivity mapping, what it does, it uh, takes in the information about the mRNA of the cells, of all the patterns of the genes expressed in these cells compared to the normal controls. And then what it does, it shows us which uh, drugs or interventions can actually lead to that state or can reverse that state. So for example, if we study um, global gene expression profiles, what we can do later on, we can uh, arrive to the drugs that can be candidate drugs for that disease to cure it. I see. Thank you so much for that detailed response. Could you tell us a bit about um, what is the clinical significance of finding differential cell populations in different data sets? Like why is uh, defining cell populations in the data a critical step in projects involving RNA, single cell RNA-seq? So first of all, uh, let me uh, tell you the difference uh, between the bulk RNA-seq and the single cell RNA-seq. Because of the bulk RNA-seq, what we do, we pull the whole sample. So we actually look at the general population of cells. We don't really know uh, the outcome. We don't really know where the signals is uh, coming from. So we would not be able to uh, point at, sp at specific type of cells. With a single cell RNA-seq, what we're doing, we're looking at each cell separately, but we have many cells. So usually an experiment with a single cell RNA-seq would involve a few thousand cells at least. And sometimes it can be more than 100,000 cells. So we have quite a large populations, so we can characterize them. And that's why it's very important to look at this type of resolution, because then we can see different subpopulations. Because when we have a result from the bulk RNA-seq, we don't always know where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. And when we look at the single cell, then we know which population is responsible for that pattern that we're seeing in the data. So that's one thing. The second thing is the differential expression. The differential expression is, um, is obtained using uh, all kinds of statistical analysis, and it's very important to use the appropriate tools because uh, when we uh, do the um, when we do the experiments and we obtain the data, we would have numbers. We would have the values for each of the genes. However, how do we know 
what is reliable, what is not, what's the reliable difference, what's not. And in order to do that, we need to use the statistical tools. That's why differential expression is very important because that's that's say differences in expression that are actually known and shown to be replicable and reliable, which means that if we saw them now, next time when we do the same experiment or somebody else does it, they should be able to see these differences as well, which means that they're stable. Right, right, I see. Thank you for that um, answer. Now, for this part of the video, we were wondering, um, I think Pani's will share her slide. If you could show us a similar slide to the one in your previous talk and maybe just briefly go over how to read the visualization graphs of single cell RNA-seq showing the expression of genes of interest. Pani's, could you please share your slide? Thank you. Okay, so what we're seeing here is a relatively large data set of, uh, obtained from single cell RNA-seq. Uh, on the left, we see the basic uh, visualization that we usually have from such data sets. Each uh, point here is a cell, and what we're seeing here is the um, uh, is the closeness between the cells based on the uh, patterns of gene expression. So, if we have two cells that are very similar between uh, between them. Uh, uh, based on the uh, gene expression patterns, they'll be very close, so the dots will be very close. If the cells are very different, then the dots will be very far away from each other. And that's what we're seeing here because we can see some clusters, so we have some really, really dense uh, populations here, and we also have some dots that are just dispersed everywhere. Once we have these clusters, it means that these clusters that contain cells that have very similar patterns of gene expression, meaning that they're probably belonging to the same cell population. And there are many different techniques that will allow us to define these populations so we can have different cell populations that are already known and we can also discover new ones. What we see here uh, is a data set showing uh, several cell uh, populations that are already defined. And each cell population is colored in different color. So as you can see, uh, we have the macrophages in orange, we have the basal cells in red, we have the monocytes in green, in olive green, and we have other cells. So once we have that, we can look at expression patterns of uh, different genes just to see where they're expressed in which populations. And that's what we can see at, on the plot, uh, which is on the right at the top. So what we can see here, that's a gene that is actually known to be a marker for macrophages. And the expression levels are shown uh, from gray, which is zero, to uh, blue-purple, which is uh, the highest level of expression. What we can see is that the cluster of cells that are defined as macrophages lights up. And that's very reasonable. That's what we would expect to, uh, to see here, because that's the uh, marker for the macrophages. However, all this is very uh, qualitative. And in order to have some quantitative information, we need to look at it a little bit differently. And that's the uh, way we're showing the um, data in the violin plot, which is uh, on the right at the bottom. What we can see here, we see each population presented separately. They're shown by violins. Here we can see only one violin, which is for the macrophages. It's the second one from the left. The violin shows us a distribution of the values of the expression of that gene for the uh, from the cells from that population. So what we can see here, we can see that we first of all can see that violin, which is uh, marked in orange, meaning that we have some uh, cells expressing that gene in a detect at a detectable level. Uh, we also can see the specific values from the cells, and they are shown as black dots. So you can see a very big cloud of black dots uh, in the macrophages. We can also see some in the other cell populations. However, since we don't really see the violin, what it means is that they're outliers. They're not, they're not characteristic to that cell population. They're just uh, single cases. Uh, and that's how we can uh, visualize the data just at the, at the first glance, just to see what, uh, what to expect next from the analysis. Thank you so, so much for that insightful answer. That was very helpful. Um, could you tell us a bit about why looking at diseases outside of the scope of our disease of interest is important? Like, what can it tell us about um, different approaches? So, uh, first of all, uh, when we look at a different disease, we can still uh, be using the same platforms. So we can do the bulk RNA seq for cancer studies. We can do it for the uh, fibrotic, study, fibrotic studies. We can do it for all kinds of diseases and not even diseases. So uh, approaches 
will be very similar because they can be applicable uh, to all the studies in the same platform and even sometimes across platforms. So, for example, if uh, one study uh, developed a method how to uh, create a type of a score that can be examined later and can be very useful, we can also apply that type of calculation on something that is relevant to our disease. Right, that's right. Thank you. I see. Um, now for the last question, would you be able to tell us what the main difference is between directional approaches such as RNA velocity and non-directional approaches? We just wanted to see how to distinguish between the two. So usually these approaches, uh, they will be relevant to the single cell RNA seq here. Mm -hmm. um, and the difference is that with the directional approaches, we can actually connect between the populations and we can see the lineages. So we can really see which population came from which population and where it where is it going and leading to, to which population next. Uh, when we have a non-directional approach, we know the connection, but we don't re really know which comes first. Mm -hmm. So Got we wouldn't it. really know which population is first. So for these types of approaches, these would be the trajectory approaches. Uh, you actually have to know the bill. You have to have the biological knowledge of the samples before you do the direction, uh, the trajectories, because there you have to know the direction prior to the analysis. It will not give it to you. Right. I see. Thank you. Perfect. That actually wraps up our questions. Uh, we surely learned a lot about the complex topic of bioinformatics, and we really appreciated your presence in our video today, Dr. Dorkin Geva. We hope to collaborate with you again in the near future, and uh, wish you have a great day. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. If you would like to learn more about the real-life applications of bioinformatics and single-cell RNA-seq, feel free to check out these videos that are linked below. See you next time!